Welcome to A Day of Prayer. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Together, let's engage in relationship with Christ through prayer, faith, and His Word. Good morning. I'm Kylan. You're listening to A Day of Prayer's Morning Bible Study. We're so glad you could join us. Before we get in the word, Lily, can you open us up in prayer, please? Yes. Lord, I just thank you for today and for another opportunity to gather with friends and family to discuss your word, Lord, and to get to know you better, Lord. And I ask that you'll send your Holy Spirit to guide us, Lord, and to show us what it is that you have for each and every one of us, Lord, and just continue to be you, Lord. And I thank you for your goodness, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yes. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. Um, and good morning, everybody. So today we're continuing our study in 1 Corinthians. We are beginning chapter 3. Um, so let's get to the word, shall we? Could I get a volunteer to read from uh, the first nine verses? I will. And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as to spirit. And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as, as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you are not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal, for where there are, there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are not carnal and behaving like m- mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Mm-hmm. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Mm-hmm. But we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Amen. Mm-hmm. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I do, yes. Um, before, before I share a comment or anything, I want to open the floor to you guys and allow you to minister what the Holy Spirit's revealed to you so we can all grow and learn together. And And, of course, included in that is to ask any questions that you may have, right? Not, none of us has arrived. We don't have all the wisdom, knowledge, understanding yet, right? But well, we are learning and growing together. So well, the floor is yours. Okay. Who's, who wants to go first? Alice can go first. <clears throat> <laughs> okay, Lord, bring to my attention... Verse one through verse, verse one through verse three, mm-hmm. where it says, "And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as spiritual men, but as carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able, for you still are, for you are still carnal. For where there, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you." And you, and you not carnal and behaving like men? Are you not carnal and behaving like men? Mere men. Mm-hmm. So what's the Lord telling you, bud? The Lord showed me that, with that, when Paul was talking about, the Lord showed me that he wasn't trying to force feed them. He was going on their level and going, okay, the Lord said, you're ready for this, and you're not ready for that, even though this... Even though they say, I'm ready for this. I need to go do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Can Can you articulate what this and that are? I'm ready to move on to the next stage of the word. Okay. In that Paul was listening and going, no, you're not. The Lord says, the Lord says you still need to stay on this stage and get the basics down. Mm-hmm. And that also kind of, the Lord brought to my 
remember it's a saying that says smoothest wait no slow is smooth and smooth is fast there's not the saying <laughs> dad talked about how the special forces that they didn't they didn't learn all these complex things they just did the bases really well okay. and that's the same thing side of the word that you have to get you can't build start building from the second floor you have to have a base, the first floor, or and then the second floor, mm -hmm. if you have one. That's right. So you can't just jump in and start building your house on the second level because that's the part that seems fun and awesome. You have to start with the foundation and yes. then move forward. But are you also saying that the Lord is the one who determines what level we are currently on and what we need and then when it's time to move forward? Yes. Okay. And, and that you have to constantly be listening to the Lord and for you to actually get the fullness and deepness of what he's trying to get into you. Okay. Like with the base, you can't make it hollow and try to make, just put on the outside and start from the first floor. The instant you step on these weak planks, you're going to instantly fall in. The planks are going to break and you're going to fall in. Okay. So... What you're supposed to do determines whether you're ready to move on. Okay. So whether or not you've done what is required of you for that stage determines if you've completed it. It determines if you're ready to move to the next stage or not. Yes. Okay. And you were mentioning something about Paul. So you, you said, were you saying that Paul was also listening to the Lord to cooperate in what level the people were actually on? Yes. And that he wasn't trying to... Rush the people and go. You got, you guys got to hurry up and move on this next level because I want to go. Let's say I want to go write an epistle to uh, a church. Okay. Do you think he was rebuking them a little bit though because they were supposed to be somewhere different yes. than where they were? Hmm. Okay. Dean, do you have something? Well, just just it's a, it's a neat um, line of reasoning that you're on. But let me ask you a question. So, um, can you wash dishes all by yourself? Like now? Yeah, right now, yeah. Well, I'm just starting, but I can wash dishes by myself. Okay, all right. So, um, and how did you learn how to wash dishes? Because someone taught me, and I was watching them do it. Okay, but you, you couldn't do it at first, right? You needed help to, to learn it, right? Yes. But now you wouldn't go to mom and dad and say, how do I wash dishes, right? Yes. Because you know how. They, they taught you how to do that. So there's something else here, too, I think, that um, Paul is saying. He didn't need the Holy Spirit to know where these people were because the evidence told him something else. So sometimes we look at, Holy Spirit, tell me this, tell me that, right? You wouldn't say, Holy Spirit, teach me how to wash dishes now, would you? No. Because you already know how to do it, right? And the Holy Spirit yes. doesn't need to step in now to teach you how to do dishes all over again. And every time you have to wash dishes, you don't have to pray Holy Spirit, teach me how to wash dishes. So Paul is saying here the evidence is pretty clear, right, that you guys aren't ready, that you're immature. What, what is the evidence that he's showing you, promise, that they weren't ready to get mature, a mature message? Can you, can you see that part in there? Yes, soon verse 4, where it says, For one, sorry, for when one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Paul, are you not carnal? Right. Are you not carnal? Good, good. And what are things that people do that help us see whether they're carnal of the flesh or of the spirit? What are some of the things that they do? Because he told us some of that there too. Look at verse somebody else three, can help sir. you if they want to. You can look in verse 3. Oh, envy, strife, and divisions among people. Right. So I like to say that um, those are the kind of things that we look for. So if we're driving a car, for an example, I know you don't drive a car yet, but we have all kinds of lights on the dashboard and they tell us if we're running low on gas or if it needs oil or if it's time to go in for service or whatever. And a lot of times those lights are red or they catch our attention. Right. And um, so we, oh my gosh, I got to do something about this. Well, we don't get we don't get mad at the car because it told us that something needs to be addressed, right? We use that as a cue. So anytime 
that we see an expression of a negative emotion, anger, fear, envy, strife, all those things, what are they telling us about somebody? Are they in the spirit or are they in the flesh? They're in the flesh. Right. So Paul could see that. But the key for you is that you get to see it too. Right. So you're already equipped to know whether somebody's coming at you from a position of the flesh or a position of the spirit, right? Yes. Yes. And you don't have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you with that because he's already given you that. So I just want you to recognize that, that a lot of times we forget what we have, what we've learned, what we really know that's right there in front of us, right? We, we were talking uh, a, a day or so ago about discernment, right? What is discerning? Telling the difference between two or more things. Right. So you have the ability now to discern between whether somebody's coming at you or talking to you or thinking from a position of the flesh, carnal, or the spirit, the things of God. Isn't that pretty cool to know that you can do that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And who's the first person you get to inspect with myself? that knowledge from God? Uh, myself. All right. So am I in envy, strife? Am I causing dimis- divisions? Mm. Right? Yes. Okay. And thank you. That's, and that's always what we have to do before we look at someone else every time. So before we get to look at that other person, we have to bring that same filter, that measurement, that tool, that discernment amongst ourselves. And if we find ourselves that we're in the flesh, then we have to stop and reset and get back to the spirit before we can do anything else. Mm-hmm. And we all do it every day, all of us, just no matter how much and how quickly we get back on track. I love how you br- you brought that out, Dean. Right there, there are evidences that we can look at, and even with that, though, there's the who's revealing those evidences. It is ultimately the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. who gives us revelation. Hey, look at this. Look at this thing here. Right? He, he, the Holy Spirit, cues us in to those things which are or are not of Him. Right. Yes. Let's also look at this. I'll say in this this manner in this context. Right. Paul is writing this letter, but he's not in Corinth to observe these things himself. He's this. He was already there. He led people to Christ. He baptized people. He's now moved on as the Lord has led him to the next place and to you know another missionary journey by all historian accounts. Right. But he still maintains connections and a relationship. And these are the things that are being reported. And, and there were num- a number of things that were reported to Paul that, again, Paul didn't see with his own eyes, but these are things that are reported. So knowing, though, because like anything else, right, we can read and know about somebody, but we can also, through what's said and through, right, what's written we can learn and we can learn about their character and about their nature and all those things right so we have the word so we can learn about the character and nature of the lord and it is much more than just he's sovereign omniscient omnipotent and omnipresent those are four parts of it yes but then we can actually understand the lord and his nature and his character and his attributes how he is right and you can also see how how paul is so yes he's addressing in this, like the first three chapters, or up to this point in the first three chapters, yes, he's encouraged, but he's also addressing the issue of division and where these things come from. But also knowing Paul and how he is and praying constantly in the Spirit, he says so himself. I'm always doing this, and I'm constantly lifting you up in prayer. There is no doubt in my mind and in my heart that Paul took the report that was given, and and as we have encouraged each of you to do, let it pass by before the Lord and get his perspective and his thoughts on the matter, because what he says is what it is. So there's no doubt that Paul passed it before the Lord to see if what the Lord if the Lord said, "Now these things are true, and this is happening," but then also why. Because 
we, any of us, have two options in how we address the matter. Out of our flesh or out of the Spirit. And we should always choose the Spirit and let Him lead us and guide us in what to say and what to do. Ultimately, we want His results. We want the Lord's results. I can't achieve the Lord's results, and no one can achieve the Lord's results out of our flesh. Mm-hmm. That's an impossibility. So Paul, in addressing this, right, again, this is the first issue or matter that he's addressing with the church, and it has to do with division. And, um, you know, just we were, yesterday, we literally brought this up. He's talking about all the spiritual wisdom and, and the leading of the Holy Spirit and and discernment and all these things. And he says, well, we have the mind of Christ. And, and, and I brought up about how, or I was led to bring up about how Paul is saying all this in addressing the divisions within the church. And you see that exact thing expressed here within the first four verses. But also it comes down to the core of spiritual maturity. Right? And this is something that we have to address within our own lives. But also Paul was used by the Lord to address this in a number of different places within the church or the body of Christ in his time. There's nothing new under the sun. So we need to address, or let the Holy Spirit reveal it to us if, if we have some of these issues or, or I'll say ultimately spiritual immaturity. But the Lord, out of love, never addresses it to uh, I'll do a, <laughs> I'll borrow your, your thing there, Kyla, Bible bonk people, right? Or mash someone over the head with the Bible, with the word, right? It's always so, because it's always because the Lord wants us to be pure without spot, wrinkle, or blemish before him. And he reveals things so that we can address them and be pure and holy before him. All right, but Paul talks about their spiritual immaturity, especially in verse two, right? Like talking about how infants drink milk. Milk is for infants. It's for little children because they can't handle the other things. He says something very similar to to Hebrews or in Hebrews chapter five, right? He talks about their spiritual maturity. It's uh, Hebrews five, verse 12 through 14. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. In other words, there's a regression there. For everyone who takes part or who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe or infant. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those by whose by reason. Those, excuse me, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. This is a, the fact that Paul addresses this in multiple times and in multiple places is something that we all should, should be aware of, right? Again, we, we, if you haven't listened to yesterday's message Listen to, listen to it, and I mean, listen to all the rest of the, the week because there's a buildup. Yesterday's message is almost a repeat of the previous two days. It's the same principles that are discussed. Why? Like throughout the entirety of chapter two, because they're important issues, but as well as our dependence and reliance upon the Holy Spirit to reveal those things to us, to give us discernment. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yes. Go ahead, honey. Thank you. So... There's, there's two things happening. God expects us to learn from his patterns and to learn things. So to identify clearly, like with what you're saying, Dean, we don't need, after we learn, this is who God is and this is who he's not. This is the work of the enemy and this is what it includes. So once we learn that, we don't need a spiritual, um, a huge spiritual impact from, the God, from God to recognize strife and envy. Does that make sense? We don't need him every time to go, strife is not of me, strife is wrong. We are supposed to learn that and move forward in it and not have to start over every time and God take us all the way back through and say, strife is not of me. I'm not the author of confusion. I'm the author of peace and 
take us through that journey. So he wants us to learn as we go and put mm-hmm. it under, you know, get it under our belt um, and keep moving forward in it. He doesn't want to have to keep rehashing baby principles with us. He wants us to learn it and keep moving forward. Yes. Now, the other side of that is when we are observing a situation, we can clearly go, okay, that's strifing in me. I know, that's, I know that the enemy is behind that. But why are these people operating in this right now? What is the root in them that I need to address, Lord? Is it fear? Is it they're letting the enemy in, but why? So that you can identify it clearly. This In this case, it was envy, envy, strife, and divisions. It could have been fear. It could have been pride. It could have been worry, you know, doubt, unbelief. It could have been a variety of things. So to, for Paul to hear clearly what it was is from the Holy Spirit, but not for him to go, um, a direct encounter with the Holy Spirit, should I say, but for him to go strife and envy is not of God. This is wrong. We should be ready to clearly identify that because we've already learned from God what he desires, his characteristics, how these things fall. And we've learned love. Does this fall under the spirit of love or no? Right. We, we can do that. We don't need to um, rehash those baby principles over and over, which he's talking to them about. The milk is baby principles. And in fine tuning, how do we deal with it now, Lord? Do I deal with it by a letter? Do I need to make a trip? How do I send a message? I send a verbal message. What, which is the right application of your spirit in engaging in this situation? So I love about God that we are able to be well-rounded. No, God shouldn't have to keep telling us sin is bad. Sin is wrong. Don't sin. As, as people of God. And as he helps us in guiding, why do you keep doing that same sin? What's going on on the, in the, the inside of you? Yes, we know sin is wrong, but why do you keep in, in, enacting that particular kind of sin? What's the reason? And God will give us insight to that. So that I just want to help us to apply that appropriately and get the, the, the wholeness of what God wants from us. He doesn't want us to discard him and go, we don't need your help. But he does expect to go, why do I have to tell you that sin is wrong? 50 years into your salvation, I still have to tell you sin is wrong? And he, he said similar things to the disciples. Mm-hmm. That's, I have to go over this with you again. How long will I be with you before you understand this? So. Well, th- thanks for saying that. I think I left something out in what I was trying to capture, especially for, for promise speci- specifically. But um, the, the enemy trips us up in a lot of ways. And we can find ourselves in situations where we don't understand. And that's okay. But let's focus on them what we do understand. Right, so my technicians will call me and they say, I've, I've got a problem with something I'm working on. And they go, and I've never worked on this before, and blah, 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 blah. And they just start getting in a direction where you can tell they're not thinking clearly. I say, well, tell me what you do know. Mm-hmm. What do you know? Well, it's got, it's got 17 wires going to it, and I've never seen these wires. I said, well, t- what wire do you know goes to what? And they go, well, oh, I know the green wire goes here. Huh? Well, I know the red wire goes here, and the blue wire goes here, and the black wire goes there, and the orange wire goes here. I said, okay, what's left? Well, the yellow wire. Oh, well, is there any place to hook it up? Well, there's only one place left. So do you think that's where it goes? They go, oh, okay, yeah, that's exactly where it goes. So they lost track with the one, but they knew all the other things, right? So, yes, God doesn't, I, I don't believe God wants to keep having to repeat himself to us, although mm-hmm. he's gracious and often does. Mm-hmm. But when we find ourselves in these situations, focus on what you do know, right? So you do have discernment, right? All of us have discernment. And the evidence is in front of us. So when we're in that confusing situation or where we're having to respond to somebody that we're not clear why we're having to respond that way, like your mom was saying, we can see these things, right? And we can go, we can, we can ask about what's the root of this. We can ask the Holy Spirit, show us what the root is because you're telling the Holy Spirit, I see this, I see this, I see this, I see this. You've shown me a lot already because you've taught me that. Now expand that part to me. Show the Holy Spirit that you're mature. Now help me see what the root is. Mm-hmm. because you've given me the tools to do the other things, I've done my part, now I can stand in faith for you to do the rest of it mm-hmm. and not be chastised for being immature, but being praised and led again to, ca- to even more maturity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. Who else has something they want to share? I do. All right, Charles?
I like to come on on verse uh, 7 and verse 8. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives it, who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. I just found that interesting when Paul was saying that you do get a reward for what you do. The Lord's not an unjust God. He doesn't say, give me all this and you get nothing from it. But the reward is not in the natural reward where we all have our hands out, expect something to be put inside of it. It's more so knowing that you'll have a good job from your father. That's enough of a reward for us. And I also think that Paul's saying here is that there's, you're not above everybody else. While you may be at a higher spiritual state, you're still in the same boat with everybody else. You're there to teach them so that way they get to that same state and they can enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't hold back the disciples saying, you become too smart, stay there. So I'm <laughs> better than you. That's right. But he reminded them that they weren't above him. Yes. Okay. He wanted them to do just exactly as he did. He wanted them to follow Christ. And the same should be true with us. We shouldn't hold ourselves in the high esteem of, since I'm the one who planted, I get all the kudos for this. But you should just hold it loosely so the Lord can do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. If we're always holding on tightly, you can't get anything or nothing can be taken out, roughly. Mm -hmm. So God does want to reward us in this lifetime, right? Yes. So there's no one that's left house and lands and children, et cetera, et cetera, for the call of Christ that in this lifetime won't receive a hundredfold return with persecution, right? Yes. Um. <clears throat> Excuse me. So God wants us to know that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him and he rewards us now and later. But he is the one that we get our reward from, not looking for humans to give us our reward. Yes. Right. That's what you're saying? Yes, I mean, we shouldn't be looking for that reward with their hands out, looking at all the houses we could possibly buy. Have a good expectation from the Lord that he will do you good because he's not unjust to forget our labor of love. And there's nothing that we can give to him that wasn't first his own or no one that lends to the Lord that he's not repaid. So there's that, but not trying to extract things from God or people either. Not trying to take the seat of honor for ourselves, but being humble, realizing that it all comes from Jesus Christ. Yes. Oh, I'm just going to say, like you were saying with Charles, that in the scriptures you mentioned, you can't have one without the other. You still need both the person that planted the seed, in, which is the word of God, mm -hmm. and the person that watered. Because otherwise, if you just water, what are you watering? You're just watering weeds and dirt. Mm -hmm. And likewise, if you plant the seed but never give it water, it's just going to die in there. Mm -hmm. And our God doesn't work by just being a one-trick pony or God's all by himself, but he gave us the church as an example. We have multiple functions and multiple facets, multiple parts to us. Mm -hmm. Likewise, we have multiple parts in this, and we could see that in God. God is three in one, mm -hmm. and he's not singular. All the glory only goes to one person, mm -hmm. but to share and to work together as a team, just like the family is supposed to be a team in a unit. And mm -hmm. you're not independent of the other, but you need every member of the family to function. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, so in your example of you need, you need the one who plants and you need the one who waters. Paul, for example, God called him to go plant in another area. So he couldn't physically be there to water consistently as often as the watering needs to happen. Just like your uh, pastor on Sunday morning, he's there to do a task, but you need resources throughout the week. Yeah. A plant needs to be watered daily, depending on what kind of plant it is. And some of them a little bit less every, you know, they're a little bit different, but most of them that are crop bearing fruit bearing um, like trees, they need a little bit of water almost daily. And depending on how hot it is and the different temperatures and for us to do what God called us to do, it's important that we allow others to do what God called them to do because it all works together 
in the whole plan of God, which is, I think is what you're saying. Yes. That's why he gave a whole body to do it. Not just arms and legs. If we were just a bunch of arms going around, we'd be an octopus. <laughs> <laughs> or we'd be a giant eye- eyeball if there was eyes, but how would we digest? How would we stay alive and <laughs> sustain ourselves? Yes, and that reminds me of the scripture where God said, do not, I think, you know what I'm talking about? You Do said, not say to the foot, you are not needed. Yes, mm-hmm. because each part is needed. And you can't walk around entirely on your hands because how else are you going to grab anything? God was so thorough in how he created us. So likewise, if he put such um, intrinsic detail, such attention to detail in how he created one human being, how much more so has he detailed his plan of creation and the restoration of the heavenly community? How much more detail has he put into that and strategic planning and um, was it logistics and all of those things? He's working all of those and he is the only one who can do that, but would even have a knowledge that it needed to be done. I wouldn't have thought of that. So it's important that we adhere to what God called us to do and also offer grace so others can do what God called them to do and appreciate all. Yes. The great points. And that's actually the message that the Lord has given us from the beginning. All right. We can go to um, Deuteronomy six. Let's start in verse four. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your home. And when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. But then he continues, and he says, So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land, which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities, which... You did not build houses full of all good things, which you did not fill. Hewn out wells, which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full. All right. So let's let's look at that because there's a couple things listed, right? The first is the Lord is one. Yes, there is Father, there is the Son, there is the Holy Spirit, and they are one, right? And we see that in numerous other scriptures. But that oneness, that unity, only comes through love. But even in that, right that, right after he talks about oneness as a result of love, right? With, that, with the, the entirety of your being, he goes into getting all these benefits of things that you didn't do, right? Which you see that, you see Paul discussing that same thing. One plants, one waters, right? Who are these people? They're nobody. The only thing that matters is the Lord that gives the increase, right? But the, the unity piece and the oneness as a result of love is stated throughout the entirety of the word. Uh, I'll just read a few, a few more select. Scriptures, right? And Malachi, he says to remember the law of Moses, my servant, which we just read, right? It's known as the, the Shema, right? The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Hear him, right? Hear the Lord, our God, the Lord, our God, he is one. All right, we just read that. But then he talks about, in Malachi, about sending Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Why? In verse Malachi 4, verse 6 to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, right? The unity as a result of love is important. Everybody being on, in one, on the same page out of love, and by the same page, I mean the Lord's page, doing the Lord's will in and through the earth. It matters to the Lord. But then also 
Because the Lord also referenced that, right? That same scripture concerning John the Baptist, right? And his point and purpose. But then also about sowing and reaping. The Lord addressed that. That's in John 4. And he says, Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. And then he says, I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their rest. You see there, it's about love, it's about unity, it's about the body working together. Not looking for glory for himself or itself, right? But it's about unity. And we are united only out of our love for the Lord. And our desire that to be obedient to him. That he would be pleased with us. Right? And then... Paul is also addressing the aspect of divisions, right? So this is like, I'll say one of the first issues that he brings up. But then Jesus also addressed that in John 13, 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And if we have love for one another, right, which is, the Lord said is the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, how would we then see strife and envy and bitterness and malice and all these other things that that Paul mentions, not just in this section, or, and um, that is First Corinthians three three, but he he mentions these things in other letters that he writes to other churches, which are still guess what the body of Christ, we're still part of the body, all working together. So that I say it because it is important for us to understand that we are still part of this body mm-hmm. and we have a role and a purpose and a plan and we have, we can't do it of our own. Right. Which is what John states or sorry, what Jesus states in the gospel of John, right? I, I read out of chapter 13, but he reiterates those, that point in chapter 14 and especially in chapter 15, right? And how is the father's glorified that you bear much fruit I can't bear the fruit of myself. I have to sow in the spirit and out of the spirit, I will reap. If I sow of the flesh, it only reaps, as James says, corruption and every other evil thing. Mm -hmm. So we have been given the blueprint on how to do the work that he's called us to do through the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit because of our love for the Father and our desire to be obedient. And then that is how he is pleased with us. Mm -hmm. And coupled with that, working diligently in the things that he's already taught us, the things that he's already added to us and equipped us with and told us are right for us to do, continue in that and continue to let the Holy Spirit work. I have an interesting question. Who taught a hand what it was made to do? God. God. How do you know? Why do you say that? Because. Because. <laughs> actually, it'd be the human. Wait, no, God still. Because he created it, and he's the one who tells her what to do. Okay. A man can't go, hey, you're just supposed to, I mean, and the natural, you can, a man can go, I'm going to grab this. Mm-hmm. But without God telling the hand the, how to use how to use it, the human won't be able to use it. The function of the hand, the function of the eyes, the ears, the nose and mouth, legs, stomach, all that was designed by God. So he knows and gave instruction, but he truly knows what the purpose is. And he gave instruction for the body to do what it was supposed to do. So we weren't walking on our hands all the time or, you know, using our bun cheeks to carry us down the road. Right. I'm, hey, it's funny, but <laughs> it's true. 
He said, no, the feet are for walking, and this is what they'll do. They'll help you jump. They'll help you run. They'll help you twirl. They'll help you dance. This is their role. Your hands are for this. Ooh, you can grab stuff. You can eat. You can wave. You can do all of these things. You can praise the Lord. You can do all of these things. That instruction came from the Lord. So likewise, with the body of Christ, the instruction of what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to go about it, its function comes from him. And if we just do what God wants, if we just do what he's asking us to do, not me doing what he's asking you to do, but what he's asking me to do, and then you do what he asks you to do, and then this one does what God asks them to do, et cetera, et cetera, the body will function properly. Yes. If your hand tried to squish up your food instead of your teeth chewing it, and your hand tried to shove it in through your navel and go, get in there. It's out of function, out of purpose, right? Yes. Yes. But when the food goes through the lips and the, the teeth chew and the tongue rolls it into a bolus and then the esophagus swallows it and the little muscles in this work it all the way down into the stomach and then the stomach acid is digested and it goes into the colon and the intestines and all of that. And then the intestines and extract all the nutrients out and discard the waste. All is well. Yes. So as we're looking at that, let's remember that is God who included how it's supposed to work, why it's supposed to work. Let us take the knowledge and the understanding that he gives us, mm -hmm. keep it with us, treasure it, guard it, keep it, right? Tend it and keep it. And then move on and let him continue to add to us. So that way we become that full stature. That way we become that accurate reflection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, it's a good stopping place. So we're going to pause there for today. And with that, can I guess I want to close out in prayer, please? I will. Lord, we just thank you for today, God, and we thank you for this devotional and this time that we were allowed to gather together to discuss your word, God. And we thank you that you're a wise God and you understand the functions and how the body is supposed to properly work, God, and that you've given us the understanding and the wisdom to function at full capacity and efficiently within the role that you've given us, God. We just thank you for our listeners and our partners, God, and we ask that you keep them and you continue to help guide them, God, as they go about their day. And we just thank you for all these things. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, we love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening to A Day of Prayer. We trust the Lord that you are strengthened and encouraged in your relationship with Christ. Visit us on our website, adayofprayer.org, where you can check out our blog, find additional study resources, or shop the official A Day of Prayer store. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So until next time, Take care and God bless you.